next uh, alumni day, so I'll tell you a few remarks, just how the idea started. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Dimitri Bertimas. I've been here 26, graduated in 88, and since then I've been in the OR Center. But this idea came about from, um, of having our first alumni day from um, uh, David Goldberg. David Goldberg was, uh, David? Uh, David uh, graduated this year from the OR Center. He's now a professor at Georgia Tech. And he approached us, uh, Patrick and I, and uh, about the idea of having an alumni day, and we said, it's a great idea, and here we are. <laughs> so to start the day, we have, um, you know the schedule, but the, uh, to start the day, I th we thought it was um, very appropriate to have John Little to be our first speaker. For those of you who do not know, John was the first graduate of the OR Center, um, I believe in 1955. Is it correct, John? Or thereabouts? <laughs> <laughs> or thereabouts. That's right. <laughs> and, uh, and, and John was the second uh, director of the center after um, uh, Philip Morse. Philip Morse was John's advisor. And John has been at the center for, uh, associated with the center and at MIT for all of the, our center's life. So uh, center has, has started in uh, 1953. So I think uh, John has seen, has seen it all, uh, as I would say. So, um, John is an institute professor at MIT, and without uh, further delay, John, the floor is yours. Well, they said that, ah, it is on. Okay. Well, the first thing I'd like to comment on was the good weather that the uh, OR Center has arranged for you. I mean, when I wrote this headline, <laughs> which I'm in marketing, you know, uh, <laughs> it was raining cats and dogs outdoors <laughs> in Lincoln. Okay, so, and, uh, you know, I wondered why, uh, <laughs> I wondered why, uh, well, they're, they're racing ahead of me here. Uh, I wondered why Dimitri uh, asked me, and then I s reflected a little bit. I said, well, I was the first OR Center student, um, and, and actually uh, checking with my UK friends, which I thought would be the only competitors anywhere. I was the fir first OR doctoral student anywhere. <laughs> And, and so you were all my progeny. <laughs> anyway, and then the other thing that's happened this year is it's the uh, 50th anniversary of a paper I wrote in 1961. Actually, I was a, a case at the time, but it, this has all sorts of MIT roots. Uh, and, and that is the paper that became known as Little's Law. So, and, uh, so I wrote a retrospective kind of uh, paper, which appeared in the May-June issue uh, this year. Um, and so I thought that was another excuse. So, and this has been a, a, a little slow year for me because I learned a tremendous amount <laughs> by, by talking to many, many people and reading a lot of papers that I should have read a long time ago. So, so let's go back. And I'm stealing liberally uh, from uh, a talk I gave and some stuff I wrote up, actually, uh, after the uh, uh, 50th anniversary. How many people here were at the 50th anniversary? Okay, about half. Well, you've forgotten it. <laughs> anyway, um, so I talked a little bit about uh, the, the life then and uh, about how I happened to stumble into uh, OR. And <clears throat> what I did was I ended the graduate school in physics. I'd been a physics undergraduate. and. Uh, and I took my courses in general exams and 
uh, in physics. But then I was shopping around for a thesis, and I shopped uh, pretty f far and wide, actually. And I was an RA for uh, Phil Morris in machine computation, which you can read the digital computer uh, uh, whirlwind. And I had an office with a bunch of other physics students, actually, in the, in the basement of uh, building six, and I called that the ORC before there was an ORC. And I lived in Ashdown House. Ashdown House. Those of you who are lo local to MIT will know that Ashdown House has moved, <laughs> and 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 the physical building is now called Nema House. Any, anyway, it's an undergraduate dorm now, and. Uh, and a, a new dorm uh, back over, oh, what is it called, University Park? Anyway, the, uh, is, is now called Ashdown House. And I have a, there's a doctoral student working around the Markin Group who lives in Ashdown House. Okay, but I also started a hydro, uh, uh, an OR thesis uh, through a contact in uh, electrical engineering and that, that Morris had. And, it w and I ended up doing a thesis on uh, hydroelectric systems. And, and my uh, compatriots in my, they didn't know it, but it was the ORC in, in, in waiting, um, in, in my office in, in Building 6, um, said, John, how can you possibly leave physics? And, well, I, I, my explanation was that Bohr solved the hydrogen atom, and it was beautiful. And then a guy named Hilleras solved the helium atom, and it took him seven years on a crank calculator. And the prognosis from there was terrible. <laughs> so, so I decided that I wanted a field in which there were a lot of hydrogen atoms. And, and I, I really haven't been disappointed. OK, so this is Grant Cooley. I did a, a, a thesis in hydroelectric systems. And, uh, and you can see it's a beautiful tourist picture with all that water flowing over the top. That is all wasted energy, terrible. Um, oh, I forgot to do something. I forgot to do something. Should have done it the minute, the minute that Dimitri let, turned me loose. <laughs> okay, well, I'll, I've been talking for two minutes, right? <laughs> so it's my Chinese clock against your Chinese clock. <laughs> okay, anyway, that's wasted energy. And so I was in, interested in optimizing. And, 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 the, and the story is that, um, that what happens in the Northwest, actually Grand Coulee is in a quite dry area. Um, the the um, precipitation falls as snow in the winter, and then there's a big spring runoff. And it is now caught by all kinds of uh, dams. We have now is the Columbia River is a series of le lakes, but uh, which I don't approve of. But anyway, um, uh, and so at, at that time, and probably today, everything fills up at the beginning of the summer, and and then if you draw start using it. You, you have the normal stream flow, but if you start using it, you, you draw down the head and you produce uh, less energy from your normal stream flow. So that becomes essentially an optimization problem. Can you use up the water uh, at about the time that everything starts to fill up again? And that's, that's what I worked on. Okay. And we'll come back to that. Anyway, in 1952, I moved out of Ashdown and moved over to Beacon Hill. 
And I, I don't know whether any of you folks, and he's now retired, but uh, Fernando Corbato was a fellow physics student who went actually into computers and was head of the computer center for a long time and did some very famous work in software. And we went over there and got a, an apartment. For, it was pretty expensive, but we could split the cost. It was $40 a week, a month, rather. Um, times have changed. <laughs> then I say Morse's office. Morse had a very nice office, and he used to sit over near the window. And uh, anybody uh, that he wanted to get rid of promptly, he sat on a very saggy couch, which happened to be right opposite his postage stamp blackboard. And his blackboard was literally that, that size, well, maybe a little larger. But ever since then, I've had a big, big blackboard or whiteboard in my office. Um, but he was good, very efficient. Um, and on my thesis, he, he asked me at one point, I, I was proposing this funny way of approaching it with recursive equations. And he said, well, uh, is, he was suggesting s simulation, random number simulation, which didn't appeal to me at all. And, and finally he said, well, uh, do you want to do it your way? And I said, yes. <laughs> and he said, okay. So I did. Later on, I, I came back with a copy of a paper that Bellman had put into uh, operational research, and I said, this is what it is. And he said, well, maybe we ought to get this published. Anyway. Anyway, then I got married, another physics student, and I moved to Marlborough Street, fifth floor walk up, but that was fine. And I also uh, brought from home uh, something called a, a victory bicycle. Now, a victory bicycle was a one-speed bicycle. <laughs> and they were mass-produced during World War II, and there were a bunch of them around at that time, uh, <clears throat> which, uh, and, I, and I, I rode that around MIT, and uh, and to Marlborough Street and, and back to the Barter Building where the computer was. And, uh, and it, it's still true today. Bicycle is the fastest way to get around Boston and the most dangerous. <laughs> anyway, that, and the uh, thesis computing was done on whirlwind. And, and, and this, of course, got me very early into the game of, of um, programming and using digital computers. This is the Barnard building. And I'm trying to, trying to figure out where Mass Avenue is. I think it, Mass Avenue is, is directly in front of us. Anyway, the, it was the house of the computer museum for a while, and, and now, which has now moved up the street. And here's my personal computer. Uh, and it was primarily a, a prototype for a, a, a air defense over the pole uh, SAGE system, and uh, which was the na a national concern at that time. Um, <clears throat> but it was free for um, uh, for non-classified computing uh, starting at about I don't know seven or eight o'clock in the evening, and that's where the <laughs> where Corby and I and others uh, showed up. And I remember it as a lot dimmer than this, <laughs> because when it was dim, the operators and there was only one operator there at any one time. Uh, could uh, see the lights and, and read the lights uh, and see what was going wrong. And 
the, the most serious thing was a parody check, but, and there were lots of them. Until magnetic core memories came in with, with Jay Forrester. Okay, back to Grand Coulee. And so I was concerned with the optimal use of stored water in a, in a hydroelectric reservoir. And I did it with dynamic programming with two state variables. <coughs> One, the depth of the water, uh, which essentially is the, is the head and, and tells you the efficiency of the natural flow at that point. And the other is the previous river flow because river flow is extremely Markovian. You build a Markov model of it. And this, I, I like this picture because it shows, <laughs> I must have been getting ready to leave about now. I, I, I programmed, they, they had a video on a camera, as you can see, uh, or they had a cathode ray tube and a camera. Um, and the clock says uh, 6.55, and the date is, and it's AM, 1954, September 16th. So I'm nearing the end of writing my thesis. <laughs> and I used to, uh, Betty sometimes came over, and uh, I'd ride her back in the, to Marlboro Street in the wee hours of the morning. Now, the, the top um, is, I, I, what I did is, is I evaluated the system by going through the complete historical record that I had for, of river flows, which the people take down. And that's about, I don't know, might have been 40, 60 years. And the top you, you, is the river flow, and you can see it's, it's off scale at the beginning and the end, that's, and that's the snow melt. And, and this one is quite low in the middle. Um, and the bottom one is is the reservoir height. So you can see in this case, uh, we, we essentially, and I'm sure I picked it for that, um, used everything that the reservoir had before it rapidly filled up. So that was my thesis. So that was my life then. And of course, those of you who correspond with me by email uh, are fully aware <laughs> that I have about the same hours now. <laughs> um, but this year was, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the 50th anniversary of a, a paper, Little 1961, and the name of the paper was a proof of the queuing formula, L equals lambda w. So let's talk about that for a while. Now, I have the proof now as a, in the form of a quiz. <laughs> so, some of you will pass, I'm sure. Uh, I'm pretty sure. Okay, so a few preliminary remarks. In my paper in 1961, I gave a, a general proof of the queuing formula, L equals lambda W. And over the years, many authors have started, started to referring to this as Little's Law. Ordinarily, you don't get to name your own <laughs> papers. <laughs> and actually, the formula <laughs> was in common use uh, in 1958 when I taught queuing at Case Institute of Technology. And uh, I showed up, and as, I saw, as, as you saw earlier, uh, I'd done an optimization thesis. Uh, and they say, Little, you're from MIT, because Morris was working on on queuing. 
um, you're from MIT, why don't you teach a course in queuing? Oh, okay, fine, happy to learn queuing. And, and, and Morse um, a, a, had written a, a book called Queues, Inventories, and, and Maintenance, which I, I started out without a text, but uh, then I, I used his, his text. But the formula was really, uh, it's littered in, in uh, Morse's book, and he clearly was uh, very uh, interested in the generality of um, L equals lambda w. And it had been proved in, true in many special cases in his, in his book, for example, the Poisson Exponential Q, uh, with uh, first in first out service is um, it, it's it's trivial to prove it and yet the paper was I mean but it was clear to Morse and to me and 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 I would explain to my classes with a, I'd give them a heuristic proof and that it, it was much more general and and I proved it in the general case Let's see what I'm going to say next. Well, let me just say, I think it comes up, but, but I went to, to get away from specific distributional assumptions. I went to big fat books on general stochastic processes, Dube and uh, Lueb. We'll come to that maybe. Now, another concern that people have written me an email about <laughs> is that it's, Little's Law is not really a law like Newton's Law, but a, but a theorem, mathematical theorem. A theorem is, is basically a tautology, although some are more harder to prove than others, and doesn't require anything serious like physical measurements or checking the real world. And all I can say is it was handed to me, and I'm not rejecting it. <laughs> <laughs> but but I, in self-defense, let me say there are precedents for this terminology, one of them being exam, the law of large numbers is basically a theorem. Anyway, I think the success of Little's Law is in alliteration. <laughs> Don't quote me. Okay, so my 61 proof used abstract ergodic theorems from the theory of stationary stochastic processes. And the, the proof that I'm going to have you make <laughs> um, tries to capture what I've come to call uh, as a result of this past year of writing the paper, um, uh, the essence of Little's Law, and it takes only a few lines, this particular case. And there are certain fields that, I mean, one of the things is most mathematical theorems never get cited, or, or, or the average citation of a mathematical paper, I think it is, anyway, it's I had a little data on it, is, uh, you know, less than two. And so there's a huge amount, and it's not even cited many times as it's referred to. And OM is a big user, and it has developed its own notation and interpretations. Very interesting. And and this is what I learned over the, well, Steve Graves so taught me a lot of this about uh, eight or ten years ago, but um, <clears throat> there's a lot more. And computer science, which very few people in uh, OR would, would run across, uses it a great deal, and, and it has its own vocabulary. Uh, and that's typical. The OM has its own vocabulary for using it. And, and I have managed to put together at least an imaginary example in marketing, but, but credible example. I haven't gone out and tried to do it. Okay, so what is it? Um, 
Well, I've got a block diagram here where arrivals have come in something called the queuing system, and which con consists of items in queue and items in service. An item I'm going to call what Morse calls a unit, but unit means something different to me. So I call them an item, but they're countable. And, um, and, they, and there's a whole lot of cases where good applications <coughs> where there is no service operation, but Little's Law is fine. Okay, so L is <coughs> the average number of items in the queue, um, dimensionless. Uh, lambda is the average arrival rate of items, items per unit time, and W is the average waiting time of an item, and it has the dimensions of time units. Okay, we're getting close. Okay, consider realization of a queuing process over time interval zero T. And I'm looking at uh, the special case, and it, it generalizes in various ways, but let's, but this is a real case and comes up. Um, uh, where the system is empty at zero and at T. So I'm gonna let N of T be the number of items in Q at T and the number of items arriving in zero T. Lambda, the average arrival rate in zero T items, so it's got dimensions of items per unit time. And L is the average number of items in Q during zero T, which is um, which I guess is dimensionless, yes. And W is the average waiting time of, of item during zero T. And you cannot see this beginning and ends. There's a set of diagrams which, uh, which are standard, which shows the beginning and end of, for each uh, arriving item. Uh, but this, this uh, N of T does not. And W is the average waiting time of an item during zero T and it has a dimension of time units. <coughs> and so, in Green, not so legible, I'm defining a, uh, an entity A, which is the integral under the curve from zero to T of N. And so it's the area under entity over zero T time units. <coughs> okay, th those are basically our raw materials are N, lambda, L, W, and A. So, we want to prove the theorem, and this is a little slow for this case. For a Q observed over zero T that is empty at zero and T and has finite T, L does equal lambda W. Okay, folks. Give me an L. L. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I said not everybody would pass. <laughs> well, I mean, they did much better in, in Edmonton, Canadian Operational Research Society did much better. A divided by big T. A divided by, but yeah, okay, okay, that sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can't memorize this stuff. <laughs> okay, lambda, that's an easy one. Excuse me? N of a T. T. N of a T. <laughs> what was it? They said if Will's law is true, this one would be. L divided by lambda. Right? <laughs> 
<laughs> okay, A over N. Only two degrees of freedom. Okay. So, there are various ways of <laughs> saying that we've, we've made it. One is to just plug it in and it works. Uh, but but uh, a more formal way would be um, would be to write out L is A over T, and then we multiply top and bottom by N, and we have N over T times A over N, which is lambda W. Okay. Well, I think you're caught up to the Canadians, but I'm not sure. I, don't, I didn't time them that, that closely. Um, but now I, I, I've, I, I've wanted an articulation of why Little's Law is true. And, and I've come up with various things, but, but I claim it, it's really based on a simple physical fact which is in intuitively obvious. And that is an item in Q is also waiting at the same time. So I'm, I feel I'm returning to physics here <laughs> for <laughs> five seconds. And, um, uh, and, and I find that a, a, a useful uh, insight. And it's, so it's a, it's a descriptor of how we view the world. OK, now, we didn't use any probability distributions. Uh, we didn't mention them. They're not required. Everything that I've shown you is deterministic and exact. And this is known and that I didn't know at the time. I don't think the, the terminology was there at the time as sample path theory. And sample path is essentially a realization. Uh, and you focus on a realization. It's, it's a general realization out of the class of all realizations, but anyway, you, you're doing all your arithmetic on a, a single realization. And in particular, and Steve Graves and I were sticklers about this with one of my uh, theoretical friends, that you don't need to have steady state conditions during zero T. And this is still true, and it's, in fact, exact. The, the formulas are exact. Uh, which I found, this is, I learned this 10 years ago when I was working with Steve on a chapter for an OM book. Um, and I said, Steve, this stuff is exact. And it's because we're in a finite interval. It's, it's true on the infinite line. Uh, that's true, too. But that's another thing. That's, that's, another, that's much heavier theoretical uh, duty. But, um, but that it's true in, in a finite interval uh, under this ending condition that I've described. OK. How about applications? Well, I was, in, in, in writing uh, this recent paper, I really wanted to have live applications. And, and I found them. I found them in OM. I found them in computer architecture. Uh, and then uh, <laughs> in a commentary, um, Ed Kaplan uh, told me about epidemiology and many other things that he says are really little slaw in disguise. But nobody in those fields realizes it. <laughs> Fortunately, he's my emissary. And so what I say 
is uh, Little's Law is here to stay. And I think it's actually, I think it's time for a new T-shirt, but any, anybody who's interested in that, come see me. <laughs> I think we could put that proof on a T-shirt. <laughs> anyway, that's, that's it. And, and uh, <laughs> <Okay>. well, <laughs> I'm woke up. All right, thank you, John. Uh, my name is Patrick Leyer, for those of you that do not know me, and uh, I'm going to introduce. Can you hear me like that? Yeah. All right, so my role is to introduce the next uh, panel uh, uh, chair, so Tom Magnanti. Everyone knows about Tom. Uh, he's also an institute professor. Uh, he has uh, many other activities. Right now, he's a founding president of a new university. Okay, Tom. So uh, first of all, uh, welcome again to everyone. It's wonderful to have you with us uh, today. So uh, before I introduce the panel, there's a few ground rules uh, for this panel and hopefully all the panels. Uh, we're going to make some brief uh, formal presentations or informal presentations, so we want to think about them. Uh, but the hope here is to be uh, very much interactive and engaging and to have an opportunity for all of us to do a little uh, thinking together, collaborative thinking. So uh, we're delighted to have our three panelists today. Um, two come from uh, prominent Ivy League institutions and one comes from a little tech school. Uh, 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 and, uh, uh, they, they all uh, have chaired positions. They're not going to give all their titles, but Dimitri Bertsamus, uh, Edward Kaplan, and Garrett Van Risen are with us today, uh, all uh, very distinguished in their fields of uh, operations research. Uh, all with, uh, uh, all, I can also say that we have three people here who have degrees from a great institution, MIT, and one who doesn't, that's me. Uh, <laughs> a little, a little uh, West Coast institution called The Farm, right? So some of you may know. So I'm going to start with Dimitri, and you might offer a uh, few comments, Dimitri, to the start. This is on, the panel is on the future of operations research. Okay. So uh, since I will be using some slides, uh, so I was uh, recently in uh, IBM last week, and it has influenced me in what I'm about to say. And uh, I would like to first, first uh, give you some data first. So this is uh, uh, the base of innovation is accelerating. So to illustrate that, so this is the horizontal axis is, ta is years. This is, various this is the penetration of various technologies. And you can see that uh, recent development, the cellular phone, PC, the Internet, has uh, accelerated. It's, it's much faster. I mean, it took, you know, how many years for the automobile to achieve, let's say, 70% penetration. Uh, things are accelerating. That's the first observation. The second observation is there is g uh, humongous growth in data. But the question is, which data? So, uh, so I would like to, to point the, this graph uh, on the right. Uh, it's a year, and, uh, and the horizontal axis is gigabytes per U.S. capita per year. And what I would like you to remember from this, this is actually real data, but uh, it's what is growing very rapidly is machine-generated data. So it's machines generated, and these machines could be storage, could be medical imaging, uh, could be uh, surveillance data, and so forth. So you see much higher growth in the order of, um, um, of a very different order of magnitude than what, what people can generate. So on, on, the, on the bottom of the curve is text data, uh, static web data, or uh, in databases that people include. So, so that's the second observation. 
Technology is, acce is accelerating a lot, and huge amount of data, especially because of machines. It's gener is, uh, Finally, uh, computing power has been growing exponentially and continues to do so. So, so this is a, a, a statistic <coughs> from, from 93 onward on uh, uh, the, we take the largest 500 supercomputers in the world and we plot over time uh, their performance. <coughs> First, the, the green line is uh, the, the sum of all 500, uh, the, the, one of them is the, 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 the fastest and the other one is the lowest. But the bottom line is that we have, and this is an exponential scale, so from 93 onward we have an exponential increase in computing power. So this is what is happening in the past. Okay? So I would like to use these observations uh, to make some comments about the future. So here's, in my view, the three challenges OR is facing for this century. So how to deal with these massive amounts of noisy data? Second, how do we deal with risk and uncertainty? And, second, and third, how do we deal with operational near real-time problems? That's, in my view, the, the most important challenges. So massive data, risk and uncertainty, near operational real-time problems. To give you some examples of what I mean, uh, this will be just highlights. So massive data and analytics, the, the areas and examples include fraud detection, predictive policing, tax audits, sports analytics, personalized medicine, my personal favorite. Okay. So, uh, and, and machines generate lots of data on that, uh, um, ap applying, what I envision is applying the, the very significant power, computing power we have, uh, to address these questions. Risk and uncertainty, everybody talks about systemic risk. We have seen what happened in 2008 and what might be happening again in Europe. Uh, modeling uncertainty and optimization of uncertainty, a problem that uh, Danzig in his, 50, in his uh, 1960 or so has devoted a long, many, many years on, on trying to address it. But I think it's still relevant today. And then on real-time optimization, I think traditional optimization has been used primarily for planning and statistic decisions. What I think is needed often is near real-time responses that would require new methods. Uh, and examples might include airline irregular operations, air traffic management, financial decisions, medical analysis, disaster management, and so forth. There are multiple examples to illustrate that. So in conclusion, I think this is a time of great opportunity for, for OR. Um, and what, what the specific aspect I was very influenced about IBM <coughs> is that in the 1950s, IBM has bet its future on the personal computer. In the 1990s, it has changed its structure to becoming a primarily consulting company. In 2010, they have decided to bet their futures in analytics. They even changed their, their names of their major businesses to business optimization and analytics. And when you see a, a company like IBM with the power and resources it has to bet its future on something, I think we should pay attention. So as a result, I believe it's a, it's a time of great opportunity for us. I also think it's a, it's, a, it's a time of great challenge. There's huge demand for services. That has been my experience in the last 20 years in the real world. But, uh, but there's also a lot of pressure to develop solution methods very fast. Academics are not always uh, doing that. But, um, but I think it is indeed a, 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 an interesting opportunity for us. And what I think is the key to success, to embrace the breadth of OR, OR has a fantastic breadth in multiple areas. And I also think it's important to work on applications that can make a difference. Um, final remarks about some fearless future predictions. Uh, so I, so uh, this is a, a, quote, a quote for Thomas Watson. He says, I think there is a world market for maybe five computers. This is the chairman of IBM, 1943. Uh, computers in the future may weigh no more than 1.5 tons, popular mechanics, 1949. There is no reason any, anyone could want a computer in their home. This is Ken Olson, 1977, the, the founder of DEC. 640K ought to be enough for anybody, <laughs> Bill Gates, 1991. And finally, my favorite, prediction is difficult, especially about the future. <laughs> right. Thank you, Dimitri.
So I, uh, we're not going to have conversations after each uh, panel discussion, but I think uh, the data that, in particular, that Dimitri showed us, I think we'll come back to and we'll have some comments on it. So thank you, Dimitri. You got us off to a great start. Ed? Okay. Thank, thank you, Tom, and good morning, everyone. Uh, great to be back at MIT, celebrate the life of the OR Center with current and former faculty and students. Um, but I regret to report that the field's facing a crisis. We're in serious trouble. We have to do something about it. We have to fix this problem. And of course, I refer to the fact that, damn it, the Red Sox lost. And, and it's all Demetrius' fault. I mean, I don't know how many of you know it's this. True. It's, it's definitely his fault. Uh, I'm going to quote you from an article in April where MIT professor Demetrius Bertsimus used quantitative models based on player analytics to determine that the Red Sox will record 101 wins. Um, and 62 all of you percent been, rate. Uh, all of you have been following the recent difficulties with uh, player personnel. Well, you know, when asked how Dimitri would solve the mounting personnel problems, according to Reuters, Bertsima said, and I quote, a player is a vector of numbers. <laughs> <laughs> so way to go, Dimitris. <laughs> Great way to build public confidence in OR. <laughs> so, all right. Enough of the cute stuff and uh, on to the topic at hand. So at a recent national OR meeting, our society president commented on the future of operations research as follows, and I quote, we need to develop new methodology and to adapt old. We need to generalize our basic theoretical techniques and to broaden their range of application. So is Rena here? Uh, well, Rena's our current president. Well, it doesn't matter because she didn't say that. Um, uh, who said that? Anybody know? John? It was Phil Morris, first president of ORSA, and the occasion was the annual meeting in May of 1953. The basic prescription, keep building up our theory, keep expanding our applications, it works just as well today as a guide to the future of OR. Now, it turns out many others have profited up their own views for what the future of operations research should be since Morris first looked into that crystal ball. And I have to confess, most of these articles are pretty boring. Um, so I'm, I'm following a grand tradition here. Uh, here's a few highlights, and remember there's a lot more where these ones came from. So in 1959, for example, Ellis Johnson, who was the director of the operations research office at Johns Hopkins, uh, wrote an article that essentially argued operations research has a great future, but it has to be primarily of a research nature. The emphasis has to be new research as opposed to repetitive application of previous successful results. So, of course, the lesson we take from that is you should all stop running regression models. Um, Johnson's admonition makes sense for academics. Repetitive application of known results isn't going to advance the profession. It's not going to gain promotions. Uh, on the other hand, uh, some applications really are routine. Someone has to address them. Not all problems are new. And for many people, an old problem is new to them because they're doing it for the first time. Fast forward 20 years to one of the better known uh, uh, articles on the history of the future of OR, Russell Acoff, who wrote a piece called The Future of Operational Research is Past. Let me just give you one or two gems out of this article. If you haven't looked at it, you should. The life of OR has been a short one. It was born in the 1930s. By the mid-1960s, most OR courses were given by academics who never practiced it, depriving OR of its unique incompetence. Um, Akoff argued that operations researchers should want to help create a world in which the capabilities of OR are considerably extended, but in which the need for OR is diminished. So to me, that doesn't sound like a recipe for growing a discipline. Um, Akoff was a cheery guy. He went on to say that um, OR had reached a limit of introversion. It was a field in a catatonic state. OR was dead. Um, <laughs> And I look around the room here, and I guess uh, we're in the afterlife. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's hard to reconcile Acroft's hard feelings with uh, more current things one can see. For example, here's a warm fuzzy from UPS, and this is on the UPS website, not the INFORMS website. UPS has an entire operations research team. The ideas and solutions that come out of UPS, the, the UPS OR team are nothing short of magical, saving UPS millions of dollars, again, the UPS website, not the INFORMS website. Or if you take a look at what the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics has to say, and I have to admit I was pretty surprised when I read this, but the Bureau of Labor Statistics pegs job growth for OR analysts uh, for the decade at 22 uh, percent, which is well above the national average, and by comparison, job growth among economists for the same decade is forecast at only 6 percent. 
Anyway, from Akoff the pessimist, we'll turn to an optimist, Alexander Renoui Khan. Ten years post Akoff in 1989, Khan uh, wrote an article called The Future of OR is Bright. And he went on to say that if there's anything worrying about the state of operations research, it's that our discipline seems to spend such an inordinate amount of time and effort worrying about itself. <laughs> and, and who can't relate to that? I mean, what should our name be? Is it operations research, management science, decision sciences, analytics, calcoholics? Uh, <laughs> I, this is another one of these annoying issues that's been around for a long time. Go back to 1952 in the Journal of Applied Physics, our friend Phil Morris wrote an article. It was called Operations Research. What is it? And he went on to say, personally, I would prefer to forget about definitions and get on with the work. After all, who cares what it's called as long as it's useful and is used? 1952. Moving right along, 1989, we have the Committee on the Next Decade in Operations Research, or the Condor, and they produced a report which could be called the Flight of the Condor. Uh, this august group cataloged achievements to date in methods and applications while proposing topics for the future. The five broad areas that were highlighted were optimization, stochastic processes, manufacturing and logistics, the interface between OR and artificial intelligence, and operational and modeling science. Now, would there will be much more theoretical work on optimization in stochastic models. Those are the mathematical anchors of OR after all, and that's a good thing. Ditto with large applied areas, such as manufacturing and service operations and supply chains. And I'll have a little more to say about operational and modeling science in a moment. But here are things that were not mentioned prominently in the Condor report. The use of OR in revenue management, healthcare, energy and the environment, homeland security, or disaster management. But the Condor report was 1989. By 2006, every one of those problems I just mentioned were among those featured at the annual informs meeting as great unsolved problems in operations research, otherwise known as goopors. And uh, other goopors that were presented included real-time integer programming, large-scale dynamic stochastic programming, and problems in computational biology. All right, let's keep going with our history of the future of operations research. The um, INFORM's leadership responded to the National Academy's 2007 Grand Challenges in Engineering by emphasizing the use of ORN, take a breath, healthcare at home and abroad, internet-enabled education in developing countries, counterterrorism, the use of sensor technologies to diagnose infrastructure faults, sustainable energy, smart transportation, medical imaging and diagnostics. All right, so after I've finished reading all of this stuff, I'm not going to try and forecast anything. But for one thing, uh, so much of what evolves is going to depend on new discoveries, uh, many of which we really can't fathom. And of course, currently popular technologies are going to easily disappear. Dimitris's earlier slide was a good one for that. If we go back to Morse for a moment, uh, here we are again in the 1950s. He was really excited about using analog devices for teaching OR. Uh, one application went like this, and I'm going to quote from Morse. A radioactive source and two Geiger counters provide two purely random sequences of pulses which may be varied in mean rate merely by changing the distance of the counter from the source. For example, one counter can represent arrivals in a queue, the other can represent the service operations that removes the, in removes the individual from the waiting line, an electronic counter can then indicate the instantaneous length of the queue. Radioactive sources in the classroom talk about glowing customers. This is great. <laughs> All right, so no forecasting. But here's what jumps out at me from looking at all of this stuff. And that is that whether quelling or quetching, uh, most folks writing about the future of OR were really not forecasting, uh, but relating what they were interested in and how they hoped to see those interests develop over time. And there's nothing wrong with characterizing the future of OR in terms of interesting problems to work on. Uh, after all, at least in my view, unlike economics or even physics for that matter, Operations research does not possess a worldview. We don't have an underlying holistic theory for how the world works. Alternatively, the natural unit of analysis in operations research is the problem. It shows in how we label things, the diet problem, traveling salesman problem, stochastic Q-medium problem, and so forth. It shows in how we decompose more complicated situations into something we can study, we can model, we can understand, maybe, can, maybe we can improve it. Now, some people would decry this OR problem-centric focus as overly narrow. 
Cherry-picking problems could lead to a portfolio of unrelated low-hanging fruit, the critics would say. And to cite one who was a critic of the Inform's Grand Challenges uh, white paper, uh, quote, OR comes across as an add-on to other people's expertise. Valuable, but not critical. Why would anyone want to be portrayed as a jack-of-all-trades but master of none? Well, I disagree. Operations research is not masters of nothing. We're not masters of nothing unless optimization and stochastic modeling and decision analysis are nothing. And advances in theory have intrinsic value in their, in their own right, like art or music, beyond the value that comes from use in future applications. Theory for theory's sake is okay. But we should also be masters of structuring messy situations into problems that are amenable to analysis. Now, the Condor report addressed operational and modeling science. The operational science part involves observing operations and collecting the data they produce for later study or for real-time analysis. But even more fundamental, operational science includes seeing or characterizing phenomena of all sorts as operations. It's the front end. It's recognizing that a problem is there. Modeling science, or perhaps it would be better to call it modeling art, calls upon our creativity to create new models for these operations. These are key OR skills. And for some of us, many people who graduated from this program, that's really what we do. Uh, sometimes immersion in a particular problem domain leads operations researchers to become subject matter experts. So John Calkins has figured out the optimal price for cocaine. Larry Wine has single-handedly secured the homeland. Arnie Barnett can tell you when your plane will crash. Uh, and Garrett will get you a seat on that plane at a lower price. And uh, <laughs> Ralph Keeney can explain why it's all your fault anyway. Um, OR is not an add-on to such expertise, in my view. Rather, our training in OR was crucial in establishing the expertise in the first place. It let us see things in a different way. So back to the future of operations research. What do we have to do? I still think Phil Morris told us 60 years ago, we need to develop new methodology and adapt old. We need to generalize our basic theoretical techniques and broaden their range of application. There's no crisis. There's no need for radical change. We need to continue discovering and formulating problems that excite us and which are also important to others. 22% job growth is really pretty good. And Demetrius, if you could just get those vectors of numbers to play a little bit better next year, we'd all be happy. Thanks. Uh, Ed, thank you. Very clever and uh, provocative as always. Um, and uh, it seems that you need a little bit more energy, though. Um, <laughs> so uh, all of us are taking these walks down memory lane. Uh, I was on the Condor Committee, uh, all right, among many others. <laughs> and also, when I was director of the OR Center, I get this note one, ta uh, one time from the then dean of engineering saying, here's this report by Eckhoff, says the future of OR is dead, or whatever it was, the title was. And he says, what's this all about? To which I had a mumble, well, wah, 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 wah. <laughs> Garrett, it's all yours. <laughs> okay, all right, thanks, Tom. Uh, yeah, so it's a tough act to follow, but I'm, I, uh, um, I, I, I agree with everything that um, Dimitri and um, uh, Ed said. Um, I was thinking when Tom sent around the topic of the panel, I was thinking, like, well, thank God, finally a use for that crystal ball I got for Father's Day. And I was like, so everything I'm going to say is going to be true about uh, the future of OR. But uh, um, the, uh, yeah, I think, like, um, if, if I had to, like, sum it up, I, I, have, I always have this feeling, like, the, the stuff that D Dimitri pointed out, that... Um, OR strikes me as like a, a, a terrific field in 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 sense of its alignment with like the realities of the modern world and how you know the things that that we grapple with as societies and businesses and individuals, but it's kind of like a badly outdated self-image. That's that's what, that's my sense of it. It's in, in in the following sense, and I think um, and maybe this contradicts a little bit some of the things that Ed was saying, but I don't think that. Um, I, I think there's this model, and I don't know, <laughs> maybe you guys can speak to where this comes from, this model of, you know, that, you know, there's an OR professionalist, an OR professional working in an OR department, um, you know, and that, you know, that's sort of the, that's sort of the professional model that we, we have. So this field's about training OR analysts to go into OR departments and things like that. And, you know, and I, my, my sense is that doesn't, really happen. I mean, in certain cases it happens, and maybe that was the initial vision of the field, but my, my sense is that most OR, most OR trained people 
don't end up in OR as, you know, in that traditional sense. I mean, John Little, he is our keynote speaker. He's now in marketing, right? So how, how does that happen? How does, how does an o, you know, the first OR student end up being a prominent figure in marketing? And, and on, on one level, I think we kind of, we bemoan that fact and we think, um, you know, why, why doesn't the world recognize OR people? But to me, that's like sort of the beauty of it. I mean, I have three daughters that are, um, in various stages of growing up, like the oldest just graduated from college, and I haven't managed to produce a scientist yet. <laughs> the youngest one, I still have hope for. But they all went to they all went to liberal arts colleges, and there's this quote I was looking at liberal arts colleges, and they have this interesting quote about that they, you know that liberal arts trains you for nothing but prepares you for everything, and uh, and <laughs> and I and I think. I think the same thing is true of OR. And, I mean, like I would say, OR trains you for nothing but prepares you for everything. In the sense that um, I don't think, you know, the vast majority of people who get educated in OR sort of end up doing OR, at least in the classical sense in which we, yeah, have to sort of en envision it as a profession. And I think, but I, I think that's, that's great. So I, I think that's like, um, uh, and it's for a lot of the reasons that, you know, Ed, Ed mentioned, is that it's like, I think it's great to, th my personal bias would be to, I think it would be much healthier for the field to think of itself as, you know, this is kind of liberal science training for the modern world, in the sense that, I mean, if you think of the, like, what are the, char I mean, there's a lot of the stuff that Dimitri's laid out, like, what are the characteristics of the modern world? I'd, I mean, it's, you know, it, there's the, the physics of it, but, John Little comes from a physics background. Like, how does the world physically operate? There's the, the economics of it. I mean, one thing that strikes me is that in the, the world nowadays, I mean, really since I think the fall <laughs> of, you know, sort of the whole communist world is like, there's this, this tectonic shift where the world now sort of, everybody sort of believes that it's, you know, economics kind of drives the world, right? So it's like, you know, so, I mean, even the Chinese believe that. I mean, they, you know, they, they don't, they don't have, you know, they have their, you know, political rigidity, but in terms of markets, forces working and things like that, that's, you know, pretty much people have come to accept that that's the way the world works and then to think of the world in those terms. So it, there's sort of the economic reality of how the world works. There's the technological reality of how the world works, which is all the stuff Dimitri's mentioned about, you know, it's a technological world, there's lots of data, there's lots of information, blah, 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 things like that. Um, and then there's also sort of the behavioral component of it. It's like understanding what motivates people and behavior and things like that. And, and you throw all that stuff together and there's like a vast array range of problems to Ed's uh, characterization of problems or issues or areas where that, that combination of factors is sort of like, you know, you need to have that to kind of understand what that, um, you know, what that problem is or what that, that particular domain of application is. And, and, and OR, I think it could, is actually beautifully positioned to kind of, because I think the mindset that we develop as OR people is, is beautifully positioned to kind of be able to kind of synthesize all those factors and, and say, you know, to work effectively in environments that involve all those sorts of factors. Um, so, uh, yeah, so to me it's like uh, the approach and the technique are really, really well aligned with the way the world works today and I think um, uh, and it's and that it's a great foundation for further specialization so I think the fact that you know as Ed was saying that you know people go into humanitarian logistics or healthcare there's this there's this a natural diffusion of people out of OR I mean that's a natural you know John's a perfect example people go into finance people go into um, uh, you know like there's this, so, you know, health, health care, things like that. There's an, always, you know, there's, I think this is always a natural tendency for people to, to get their methodological base in OR and then kind of drift into areas where they, you know, have interests and expertise and things like that. And, and rather than bemoaning that and kind of complaining that, oh, nobody recognizes OR and there's, you know, all these, you know, I think that we should just, I think that's something to be proud of. And, you know, so, um, you know, it's like, it's like, you know, do English departments sit around and say, you know, how come nobody recognizes our English majors out there, you know, <laughs> in influencing the world and, you know, labeling us, you know, 
I don't think they care about that. I mean, it's like they, they're just they're they're proud of the people that they produce and that the fact that they um, they go into influential positions and they do things in other domains and you know and uh, you know so I, I think that's not something to 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 really worry about. And I, I, my 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 sense is like informs in particular in places like that worries about that too much. Um, that you know the the profession as it exists and as it's identified, you know that people don't recognize it. You know and. I'm like, so, <laughs> I guess my bias is, so what? I mean, so what that they don't recognize it? As long as the people that are, you know, that the field itself is active and the people are doing good things and kind of, you know, having influence, you know. I mean, to me, it's a, it's a point of pride that, that we've placed people that have had influence in so many different fields. I think that's a great thing. Um, now, now, having said that, I think, like, what, okay, so what, what if you would take that perspective, what, what does the field need? And I think... I think if there is um, a need for change, it's a little bit more on being a little bit less myopic about what the field is. I mean, I think, I think there are issues around, I mean, it's, there are, you know, the traditional kind of optimization stochastic process. I think that's great things. But my sense is, like, um, if you do want to take this, like, liberal science view of what it is that people need to be trained for in the future, I, th I think there's components that we don't do as good a job as we could do of educating people. And, and I think in particular, like, um, there was in historically much more closer alignment between economics and OR. I think we, we could, we would serve our students better to have them have a little bit more training in economics. And I, I also think in things like behavioral science, you know, there, I mean, there's a huge people component to anything that you do in, um, in a lot of domains of practice in OR. And I think knowing something about, and there's been huge advances in sort of understanding the science behind human behavior and decision making and things like that. So I, th I think more, more training in that area um, would be useful. And then I also think to Dimitri's point, um, sort of a closer alignment sort of with advances in computer science and information technology would also, is also relevant. And, you know, so, you know, if I were to th think of what maybe an ideal OR training would look like in the future, it would look a lot like what it does now in terms of the mindset and some of the you know, systems thinking and, and the traditional tools we know, but maybe augmented with a few of these other things that are a little bit more, in my mind, sort of relevant maybe than they were, you know, decades ago when I was trained. <laughs> so, yeah. So, yeah. So that's, that's all I want to say. Thanks. So, thank you, Garrett. All right. So I have actually a set of questions that our students have prepared for the panel, but rather than addressing them directly to you, I'll just open the floor now for uh, questions or comments from the audience, and we have some mics available, and we hope you'll all chime in with something. If not, I will. Questions, comments? <laughs> Please, we, we, if we can, I, think I don't Mitch know if we can Berman move the there. mics around. <laughs> <laughs> Better just to pass the mic around, I think. <laughs> Uh, hello, I'm uh, Al Calvo, <clears throat> graduate of 72, the OR Center. <clears throat> masters. At that time, I guess, they, they, they gave out masters rather than PhDs, right, which is now. <clears throat> My we question still do three. masters. <laughs> what was that? We still have masters. You still have masters? Of course. Um, question has to do with <clears throat> application of OR and decision makers. I, I, I studied under Ralph Keeney at that time, was postdoctoral student here. <clears throat> so I graduated with my bag of tools, and I said, I'm going to solve a lot of problems in the world, <clears throat> join a small <clears throat> company task, local here, <clears throat> and joined the public systems group, small group that was working, had grants from the federal government <clears throat> working in the justice uh, system. So we had uh, applications in... Newton Police Department, Revere Police Department, et cetera, try to reduce uh, breaking and entering, auto theft. And so <clears throat> my first uh, task uh, in the Newton Police Department, oh, we're going to solve this breaking and entering uh, problem. So we collected a lot of data where these uh, uh, breaking and entering uh, <clears throat> uh, crimes were happening in Newton and at what time. <clears throat> Did a lot of statistical analysis, et cetera. At that time, we didn't have any laptops or computers. So we <clears throat> designed two wheels, uh, a portion in terms of region where these crimes were happening, 
the larger the region, the more frequent, and, <clears throat> and uh, time of day. So we went to the captain of detectives, and, and there were, at that time they had three patrols, and they were sort of uh, roaming around Newton without catching any thieves. So I said, well, let's maybe we concentrate based on what the data tells us and time and place, and um, maybe we catch some thieves. And so, <clears throat> so we did that and <laughs> came to the captain and explained it to him, et cetera, and he says, okay, I'll try one day and say we catch someone. <laughs> And it was very, I mean, the thing didn't go any place. Maybe we had computers at the time and get a listing <laughs> every day of where and, and how to deploy these uh, uh, patrols would have helped. But uh, we, I mean, this issue of convincing the, the decision maker of the value of OR, et cetera, I think that's something that the, the organization or the OR field uh, misses. I'm, I'm, well, see if your the panel has any me. comments on that. Well, it, it, it's sort of interesting that you mentioned that particular example. First of all, if Dick Larson was in the room, he'd be a better person to answer. But in any event, you know, there are, of course, many situations where you, where, where you discover something and, and people are not willing to give it uh, a shot, perhaps for reasons of tradition, perhaps for reasons of saying, you know, what do you know? I've, I've been a policeman for millions of years and you haven't. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, actually, policing is one area where a lot of experimentation around issues like this really did happen. Uh, not only around breaking and entries, but around uh, questions like, uh, oh, is it better to have one officer in twice as many cars or two officers in half of the cars under the idea that you could, you know, field more cars, you're more likely to catch somebody. The officers didn't like it because they don't feel safe and they'd want the backup anyway. There are experiments uh, of the form trying to figure out, you know, what's the right patrol speed. If you, if you drive too fast, you cover more territory, but you don't see things when you go past it if it's happening. That's a, sort of a search for your idea. If you, if you go too slow, given that something's happening, you'll see it. But of course, once 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 the bad guys figure out what you're doing, they'll they'll just take their business elsewhere and so on. So you know, uh, I think a lot of what you're talking about uh, is true, but it's also circumstantial. There have been uh, actually a lot of I would think pretty forward-looking work and actual full-scale social experiments on exactly those kinds of topics. The Kansas City Preventive Police Patrol experiment back in 1975 being probably the biggest one, but, but there have been a lot of others. So uh, it, it depends where you are. I, I, I'm most familiar with NYPD, and a lot of what they do actually, I think, really is pretty forward looking. But anyhow. Are there comments from the panel? Dimitri? Uh, yeah, we, we, I will generalize a little bit. Speaking from my own personal <coughs> experience, <coughs> the way I found that uh, the models we develop and study can have a better chance of being applied uh, in the where we intended to be applied, is not only to have you know, quality in that. I used to believe in, in the past that quality is not enough. What I have found is that uh, um, to, to put the key decision makers in a position that they feel ownership of what has been produced. Uh, and to be honest, this, now that I'm a bit uh, wiser with more white hair, I have found that this is uh, perhaps more important than, than uh, even the the quality of what we, we, have, uh, we have done. Uh, a, a, a question you know, about policing I have in the last year and a half, uh, together with uh, two of my doctoral students, uh, Michael Frankovitz and Alison O'Hare, we have been involved with the, trying to do some work with the police department here in Boston. And uh, you know, from the very beginning, we had exchanges with the top echelon of the, of the environment. We had, you know, frequent meetings and so forth. In the end of the day, they, I felt that they had ownership of the, they did actually, they have contributed with ideas and so forth. In the end, the transition to actually applying it was, was better, was, was much smoother. Okay. Thank you. Mitch, was there a question? Yeah. yeah. We're just passing the mic, Mitch. Um, so first, first let me say I'm, I'm quite aligned with what the three speakers said, except on one dimension, which I almost want to say, and it was a shame on us. Your point about the successes of OR is absolutely accurate. In fact, if I look at all the alumni that I've known, I can't even think of one that didn't end up in a good spot, very influential in their field, very well embedded, everything you say. 
But if I went into a store and I looked at the inventory left on the shelf, and every day I went in there and there was zero inventory left, what that tells me is I never put enough stock on my shelf to really take advantage of what the real opportunity is. And as much as, um, Ed, you say that there's not an importance of a definition, and I've been on the committee and informs, and I've listened to all the arguments about trying to define ourselves, I do see not defining ourselves creating two very fundamental problems about the future of OR that I think are worth addressing by your panel. One is that while we think we're very well embedded, I can tell you as someone who's out there speaking about these topics all the time, that if I go into an organization, airline, transportation company, manufacturing, hospital, that the number of people who know to come to us or to our field to solve the range of problems that are actually can be, this field can be applied to, is negligible. I mean, when you have a legal problem, you know to go to a lawyer. When you have a medical problem, you know which doctor to go to. The number of problems that are out there that can be solved by us that people have no idea to come to us is immense. Now, why does that affect all of you, especially those of you in academia? In Europe, there's a very particular problem about educating young people as to why they would even want to go into this field. You take some of the best minds in Central Europe, particularly in France and in Germany, because we're actually looking to hire there now, and the best minds do not go, because you really need advanced studies to do this. And what you find is they don't go into this field not because it's not interesting, but they don't know what it is. And so what I put to you in terms of the future of OR is not so much that we have not had a great history and infiltrated very well, but do you, do you see us sort of maintaining this path of sort of the silent achievers, right? Or do you see us really, because I, I think that the opportunity, and I've talked to Dimitri about this in, in terms of a, an analytics program at MIT for masters, but do you see that there's, do you see that there's a shortage of people who could really be going into this field? Because I do, and I'm just sort of looking at what you think in terms of our potential, not what we've done, but really where we could go with it. That's so I have long-winded statement. Great, no, it's a great question. That's, uh, anybody in the panel? Yeah, go. So um, go, go. I, I do believe that uh, OR has a marketing problem. Uh, so, um, and uh, I agree with the statement that uh, the field doesn't have a, the recognition. So if somebody has a problem, doesn't doesn't even know about who to ask. I agree with that statement. Um, on the other hand, I do feel to some degree we can change that. Uh, and um, our answer here would be to, at least at MIT, to where we have been thinking for some time and we are in the now final stages of uh, implementing uh, an analytics program where we have people who would. Uh, uh, master students, you know, double the size of this program, who, you know, from, and not, let's say we have 50 graduates a year, hopefully other places will do similar things. Um, this itself uh, would help. Uh, now, the, the, the marketing aspect, so this would perhaps alleviate to some degree. We have more people to, to, uh, to, to hire from and so forth. But, but, uh, the marketing problem is a serious one, and um, uh, <laughs> so it's a, it's, I mean, I, I, and, I, and I feel this is something that is worth addressing. I'm not certain the professional society is a no, place to do it, but but uh, but uh, I think it starts in a way from uh, from the places who uh, educate the young people for for the next generation, and it's in many ways it's up to us to make the appropriate changes and. Uh, so, for instance, examples of the type of uh, of some OR professional makes this, uh, these comments about the Red Sox apparently not so successful in the end. <laughs> uh, I think it might, I mean, I, I mean, collectively, I have found, <laughs> this is the first time, actually, I spoke to the media. Uh, <laughs> and, and last don't time. Do, don't do it again. <laughs> The, the, but, the, problem, the problem is you should try basketball. Okay, <laughs> we are starting there. But, 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 but I actually believe uh, it, it helped, I mean, it, it helped the field much more than my collective union of my papers and books. <laughs> <laughs> because I have received people from people who don't know anything about that. This helps. <laughs> that helps on the marketing side, for example, of the field. So, um, can, can I make a suggestion? What I think is, 
in the, to the professors at MIT. Something Amadeo Adoni, I'm oh, sorry. Something Amadeo and Adoni and I did, it was just 20 years ago, and Tom McNanty might remember this, but we had this little program where we were going to go around to liberal arts schools and just tell them what OR was. And in some ways, I think something to consider is that getting, because I can tell you, we even, we come to MIT to recruit, we come to Princeton to recruit. 98% of the kids we speak to don't even know what this is. They just don't, they've never heard of it, they don't know where it's applied, they don't know what they can do with it, okay? That and at the business school so that when you go to an executive and you at least tell them what you do, they've at least heard of it. I'm not saying we have to define it any better because I, I agree, it's really hard to define. But the awareness, I'm just, you know, I, I don't want to leave us blank with nothing to do. I think there is some, I'm anyway, sorry, I'm not supposed to answer, I'm supposed to put it forth to you, but I think there are, I think there are ways of, of dealing with it. And, no, can, so, I, can I just jump in a second? Like, I, I think what you're raising is like kind of <laughs> sort of the point I was trying to make a bit, which is that I, I don't think I really don't think that's the right mental model. Uh, that that you know it's kind of like oh I've got a problem I'll go to the yellow pages and look up OR analyst and you know you know call and have them come in and I, I don't think it's really necessary for people to identify that OR analyst thing as sort of a separate profession. I, I, you know, like, I think like maybe to the point about the police one as well is like, um, you know, my, my, my sense is like the people who have been most effective coming out of OR programs are people that kind of get involved in a certain application area and really develop domain expertise in that application area. It's, it's not like, you know, well, tomorrow I'm going to work on police stuff and then, you know, on the weekend I'm going to work on the Red Sox problem and then I'm going to, you know, and then I'm going to go and work on energy stuff. And it's like, I think that kind of, that you're, you're this kind of like, person that's going to parachute in and kind of do these one-off problem-solving things. I think that's like a, I think that's not the right model of it. I think it's, and, and I, you know, to Mitch's point about like, okay, so how do you, how do you get students attracted to this field? I don't think to say, well, come into OR and then there's all these great, you know, kind of OR analyst things you can do afterwards. I would say like go into OR because it's great general training for a variety of things that are kind of interesting to do later on in your career. It's not, I, I think holding out the fact that there is, you know, this profession of OR analyst that's, you know, sort of a good field to get into is I think maybe the wrong positioning. I mean, I'm like, I, I know that kind of flies in the face of what, like, what a lot of the field is set up to do, but I think if you just look at the reality of it, I think that's how, you know, that's how most people's careers evolve in this. I mean, like. Ed's been effective because he's really developed domain expertise in public health. So when, when he goes on, you know, when the, like to Dimitri's point about the press, when the press comes and talks to Ed about public health, they would say, you know, public health expert Ed Kaplan. They wouldn't say, you know, OR analyst Ed Kaplan or, you know, so it's like that's, you know, so I, I think really that's kind of, you know, I think it may be more effective as a, as a profession if we tended to think in those terms um, rather than than the OR analysts that you call up to kind of come in and do something special for. So that I mean that leads to I think an interesting thought about the, sort of think of topography of higher education. Yeah. You pointed to the literature folks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Are you suggesting we're English more like major. we're English more major. like the or the English majors? <laughs> we're more like the English majors than we are to. To the engineers or the lawyers, uh, uh, like there's a, let me just give you a personal anecdote. Like I was yeah. in my, the first job. I was an electrical engineer as an undergrad, and the first job I took uh, was at Bell Labs, um, and I got in, and I was in the systems engineering group, and I, I literally, like, after a month and a half there, I was like, literally sat down and was crying at my desk because it was, I was so depressed <laughs> about, about about what it was, the reality of being an engineer. I was just like, oh my god, like I, I had these like. Hey, hey, be these, careful what you say. <laughs> no, no. I mean, I, I, lo I love engineering, but it's like I, I, my job, my job was to like go over these technical specifications, these giant three-ring binders. They're like six <laughs> volume, you know, technical specifications for some, you know, I can't even remember what it was really. But and then and then I remember going to the library and looking at this, you know, there was some like OR journal there, and there was some article about um, orienteering. Like you know how to find your way through you know to optimize your route on some um, 
you know, map or something of that sort. And I just thought, oh, well, that's, <laughs> you know, like I, I, I kind of realized that, like, I, I, I just sort of had this regret about, like, specializing, like, specializing at that, so much at that point in my career. And I think, you know, the appeal to me, if someone had come to me in the early days of my education and said, you know what, yeah, you know, this is a field where you really don't have to, you know, commit yourself and specialize, but it's great training for all sorts of things that you could, you know, could do and find interest in later. I think that would have been really appealing to me as a grad. Yeah, as, yeah, as that's a, exactly what I'm saying. That's exactly what we're not doing. No, but, but what you're saying is that, you know, I thought, I thought what you would say. Like, I thought what you were saying is that, you know, convince people that, that the profession of OR as being you know, like an OR profession, professional is sort of, yeah. I got lucky that Tom Tucker, or Alan Tucker's son, was my advisor in undergrad. I said, by the way, there's this yeah. thing called OR. Yeah. No, but the way I position it, I mean, maybe just this is a subtle difference in positioning, but the way I'd position it is, you know, this is a great field, you know, as, as general, general sort of scientific, you know, like I, like I said, liberal sciences training. Because look at people like, you know, John Little, who, you know, became an expert in marketing, or Ed, who be, became an expert in public health, or, you know, there's all sorts of things you can do with this afterwards. But I wouldn't say, I, I wouldn't position it as, you know, because being an OR analyst itself as, like, as a profession is, like, is such a promising thing. Right? I, I, I think in some ways Mitch is suggesting that's one aspect. The other aspect is just awareness. And yeah. You, you happen to run across this paper, and that's, that was your awareness. Right, 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 right. Uh, you know, we, I think we as a profession tried many years ago. We actually sent out 10,000, uh, I think it was, they were videos at that time of, uh, something called OR and U, an exciting career, went out to 10,000 high schools to try to promote the profession. But it had very little impact at that sense in terms yeah. of our, our visibility. I think there's another question? No, and I could ask people uh, just sort of sign in in terms of say who you are, et cetera, just to remind everybody in the audience. Yeah. I, I'm Tony Cox, uh, class of 1986. Um, and I think the world's first PhD in risk analysis, which was a little... Uh, sort of sub-flavor of operations research. And I, I, I agree, my own experience, I, I, I agree with the proposition that to have impact, you really have to go into uh, some area and, and, and acquire expertise uh, there. I used to work for a company that I loved, Arthur D. Little, which has a long history uh, with the MIT OR Center, which would offer pounds and pounds of the highest quality operations research for, for a, a pretty good price. It no longer exists because I think that model probably doesn't, it doesn't really work anymore. But I want to ask for your thoughts on what I see as a different challenge to the, the future of OR, which is even if we accept that the way to have impact is to uh, be embedded in an important area such as telecommunications or, or uh, um, anti-terrorism, uh, 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 work, it strikes me for, from what I've seen that the biggest threat to good OR is bad modeling, bad analytics. Um, people don't think that they need an o operations research expert because they already have Excel and they don't feel a strong need or really differentiate between what OR people do and what um, anyone with uh, a regression package um, and an Excel spreadsheet uh, can do. And economists uh, sometimes refer to Gresham's Law, which is that bad currency drives out good, um, or uh, uh, debased currency drives out pure currency. I worry about that for operations research, and I'd, I'd be interested in your thoughts. Good. Thank you, Tony. Panelist? Well, there's Many more and make sure they can hear. And make sure they can hear. I was just going to say, there's, there's, you know, part of this is a supply issue. There's a lot more people who run regression models than there are people who are going to try and put together something from first principles for whatever the issue is. So that's hard. Um, I think there's a certain entrepreneurial spirit that is needed here. Uh, by individual OR people, and, you know, you, you find what it is that that you get excited about, but then but then take it to the next step. It, it, it's in some sense not realistic to think that people out there will find you. There's not a, there aren't that many OR people. I mean, that was the other thing. I, I, 
I've got the statistics somewhere, but the total size of the OR labor pool, as it were, was something like 50,000 in the United States. It's not, it's not a huge number. Um, and, and, and so it's kind of unrealistic to think that they would find us. So I think it, it, it's, it's almost leadership by example is sort of what it comes down to. And by the way, if, if, if you see bad work being done, it's important not to simply say this is bad unless you have something to replace it with. The name of the game is do you have something better, right? Because to, to get a reputation as just sort of a naysayer who does nothing but criticize other stuff which is out there, because there, there could be all sorts of other benefits that that person brings to the table in terms of how they get along with the team and you know, selling stuff to other agencies or whatnot. So I, I, I think it really does kind of fall on us a little bit to, 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 to be entrepreneurial uh, on, on those kinds of problems. I, I, don't, I don't see how you can stop it from happening because we're just totally outnumbered. So, so let me jump in with this the thought about this entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. Let's think about an OR education. Mm -hmm. And many of the students who are here, uh, many might want an academic career, be like us in some ways, but uh, there's many more jobs that are uh, of other character in terms of this entrepreneurship going out and changing the world uh, in a variety of ways. <coughs> Should we be teaching things like entrepreneurship as part of educational programs? Should we be providing more opportunities for people to move into other fields and give them the skills to move into those fields and use our tools? Could the panels talk a bit about that? Uh, <clears throat> so my, my, my personal view on the matter is the following, that uh, historically the way we have been teaching OR is a methodological viewpoint. We start with uh, linear optimization, uh, stochastic processes, and so forth. So I actually believe the, but so armed with this, when I went outside the real world, the real world doesn't work like that. The, the problems don't come with a label. Mm -hmm. but, but problems are problems, and they typically require breadth of activity, not, not, uh, so I actually believe that the right, or not, and I think it's fine to have depth and so forth, but in addition, I think the, a new generation of courses is needed in which we start with a problem. I mean, this is after the basics. I mean, I'm not saying it replaces the basics. We have the <coughs> basics first, and then after the basics, we have courses that, uh, that start with a problem, and then people will do modeling, they, and then they do whatever people do in, in, the, in, in the real world. I think this is, this, I, I view this is in our future, uh, and at least personally, um, I, um, I mean, I have been teaching a class like that in the last two years. I'm hoping to, to strengthen it um, moving forward, starting with an application and moving forward on that. But I, I, think, I think one of the challenges, and I'll get to that, and we're going to get to other questions as well. One of the challenges there is the range of problems that we have interest in are very broad. And mm -hmm. so you want to teach something on health care, some students have an interest in that. You want to teach something on transportation, some. Is there generic things we can teach them that they can use to go off and, and solve all these world problems? So I, I, I took a stab a couple of years ago at teaching a course called Problem Framing. And the, the whole idea here was basically not to give people problems, to give them, for lack of a better term, situations or what Acoff would call a mess. You know, people have angst about something. Something's, uh, you know, something's not working right. And, and, to tr and, and to try to get that people to structure the mess into something which they could analyze without following it through to the end. In other words, it wasn't, it wasn't a course about actually the techniques and coming up with an answer. It was, it was all about getting started. That's what the whole thing was. Um, it didn't work very well. All right. Uh, it shouldn't be a surprise because no one taught me a course like that. I don't know of any such courses uh, that exist. And, and usually, and plus these were not OR students. These were MBA students. So basically people just started arguing. But, but, but it did, it, it, it did, it, but it did, it, no, no, but no, no, but it did teach me something though. It, it, it taught me certain things about our students which I hadn't totally realized before, which is that you give someone a situation and the natural inclination is not to be like a, a scientist and explore it. That, that's just not what the inclination is. They're, they're, they're a little bit more like lawyers in the sense that they want to adopt a position, whatever it is, and then fight like mad for it. They, they seem much more comfortable sort of in that role of just kind of adopting position and, and, and pushing it through rather than trying to go back and say, well, wait a minute, okay, let's start. That whatever the situation is which is bothering you, 
why is it bothering you? You know, what, what are the indicators which are telling you that something isn't wrong? And they say a few things. They say, well, if the situation wasn't bother you, bothering you, what would those same indicators look like? Try and get them to sort of deduce from the decision maker, client, uh, whoever is bringing this uh, issue up, you know, what are their intrinsic performance measures, which they themselves, by the way, often don't recognize. Um, you know, I, I, I had a silly example like this my very first year at Yale. I had a group of, of students work for the city of New Haven to try and redesign the snow plowing routes. Now, that's actually a pretty well-posed problem already, okay? But, but, but nonetheless, um, the guy comes in who had been doing this by hand for years and years, and so we sat down and said, so what's the problem? And he said, well, the problem is we have some really bad routes. And said, okay, give me an example of a really bad route. And so the guy sits back and says, well, there's this hill. <laughs> Which one? We said, what do you mean there's this hill? He said, well, it's a real st steep hill and the plows get stuck going up and down. I said, well, do you have to plow that street? Do people live on it? Yeah. So any route that has that hill on it would be a bad route? Yeah. You don't have a snow routing problem. You have to plow a hill. It's a pain in the butt. But you know, <laughs> that, that sort of and, and, and but the students, uh, you know, the students themselves said, "How about if we ask how often is the plow on the ground versus how often is the plow raised?" And maybe you would like your route to be such that as often as possible the plow is down instead of up, and you know, trying to actually get some notion of efficiency across. And that's already as I said something which is pretty pre-formulated. The, the sorts of situations we tried to deal with in, in, in the other course were much messier and much more, you know, what should Google do in China, that, that, that kind of thing. Um, but, but nonetheless, uh, that's a huge skill, the ability to take something and structure it and turn it into something that we can then start thinking about in a systematic and analytic way. So, you know, what ways could you actually do this successfully in a classroom? Maybe instead of trying to do it the way I did, which was actually try and introduce various principles. We would talk about decomposition. We would talk about reasoning by analogy. We would talk about, well, this is really, really complicated. Can you think of the world's simplest instance of this thing and see if you can understand the simplest problem? And then maybe in, in sort of by uh, induction in some sense work up to bigger ones. Um, it didn't work so well. Uh, but, but the other approach, which maybe could work, is more one of a consulting type approach, I guess, where you would have people from the outside come in who have issues and talk about it. It becomes more of a project-oriented course. And the, the downside with that is you wouldn't be exposed to as many different problems, so you wouldn't have to go through this problem formulation exercise as often. But on the other side, for at least one or two cases, you might go start to finish with something and, and deal with a lot of the uh, intricacy. Yeah, we itself. might come back to this. I, I would draw a distinction between sort of problem formulation, problem solving, and entrepreneurship, right. figure, yeah. which I think are a little different skills. Yeah. Although, let's go to our next question. Then we'll well, just, just I, really briefly, I, yeah. I would just say that I, I think that's a great, but I think actually the entrepreneurship is a good model. Because what does an entrepreneur do? It's like senses that there's a need for something and senses that there's a way to kind of address that need. You know, in the consulting kind of mode, it's more like, well, somebody else senses the need right. and they bring you I'm in. Solving and, your and, and you have to kind of come up. But, you know, like roughly speaking, I think those are, the same set of skills, and I think like understanding, understanding how much value you can add, you know, when what it would take to add that, and things like that. I think, mm -hmm. you know, I think that's that would be really helpful to train people on that. Yeah. Yes. So for those of you who have not, wow, it's really loud. So for those of you who have not met, my name is Vishal Gupta. I'm a third year PhD student at the ORC. So listening for the last hour or so, um, I would kind of note one commonality, which is that none of the discussion we've had is really centered on particular quantitative techniques. Rather, the things we've been talking about have been skills, and they've been skills like um, fostering stakeholder ownership, or soliciting information from uninformed experts, from, um, you know, problem framing maybe is kind of there. So this, these are what you know are pejoratively called soft skills and typically don't occur in a traditional OR education. Um, they're things that, you know, negotiation occurs in an MBA education, let's say. Um, so what I would ask is kind of proactively, we've talked a little bit about what we, education should be, but right now we have the minds and ears of kind of a room full of ORC graduates that are in the industry and academia and students. But what should we be doing to build these skills if we really think that they're fundamental to the success and practice of OR? these softer skills. 
But I think that's very consistent with the conversation we've just been having here mm -hmm. in terms of this problem solving skills, negotiating skills, and all. But more conversations from the panel on this or thoughts? I mean, just to mention, I, my own view is that uh, at least in the areas that I think are quite challenging in the future, all of them need depth of understanding, real-time optimization, large data sets and data mining, risk and uncertainty. So they are based on fundamentals. Now, uh, but in addition, I, I think a view towards uh, focusing on problems, even if they have nothing to do with each other, um, it is, uh, I consider it uh, quite important for the success in practice. Now, in terms of uh, um, what you call softer skills, namely uh, sort of leadership and, and, and so forth. My, my experience is that the best way to do these softer skills is, is by example. I mean, I'm not certain these are necessarily teachable in a, in a classroom setting. That's my, this is, there's disagreement on it. I mean, the, the Sloan School here teaches courses in, in, in this and the other, but, but my personal view is that the best way to, to achieve this is by doing, not by observing. Gareth? Yeah, well, I was going to, um, yeah, I, I, I think to Ed's point that, that I mean, it, like you're spot on in the sense that I think it's, you know, it's like, oh, you know, you need all these analytical skills and, you know, I think you need that base of kind of scientific background to, to address these problems because that's, the, that's, but to Ed's point, I think it is, it is a hard thing to teach. I mean, um, and I would agree that that's sort of a gap in the sense that, um, you know, it's really what's required to be quite, to be successful in this field, but it, I, I think that my sense is it's been sort of done more by osmosis, to like um, Dimitri's point. It's like you hang out with OR people and they have a certain sensibility about things and you observe them and, you know, it's like you kind of pick it up culturally. That, that's my sense. That's, that's the way it's handled currently. It's like, well, that kind of presumes that we do it well currently, <laughs> right? So you can't well, learn your colleagues, your community, your community does it well enough that, that, that hanging out at the OR Center and hanging out with professors and other students and, you know, you'll kind of get it eventually um, and ob observing it. But so are we, are we different than other professions in that sense? So think of physicists, engineers. I mean, all people are technically no, grounded. I don't think so. Very few people, physicists, uh, physicists a, who go out and become physicists, physicists have right? a culture around right. how they address things, and you know, it's not just about learning the mechanics of mechanics. For example, <laughs> I mean, it's like it's about you know, it's there, there's a style of thinking and a, a, a culture around you know how you how you structure things and think about the world and. So I don't think that that's necessarily a, a bad thing, um, but I, but I think I mean, we could do more. I think in the terms, I mean, even even like you know, like a case study class or something on how you would, you know, examples, I mean, to learn by example. Um, I mean, I think there's more we could do to kind of formalize learning by example rather than just water cooler talk and kind of, you know. Yeah. So I think it actually um, would be interesting, interesting to get some views of the current students about whether they would welcome such courses or not or feel that, that was okay. distracting from other things they wanted to learn. Uh, you know, there's a certain paternalism, we can have graying-haired or balding hairs, or however you want to think of all of us at the panel, uh, versus younger people. I prefer to think of emerging skin. <laughs> <laughs> Tom? Yes. Actually, I, I would like to add to the conversation. Suleiman Kashani, Columbia University. And maybe I can actually get to Garrett to engage a little bit more, because we are doing a number of things uh, on professional master's programs. And I, I'm hearing uh, from, from Dimitris that this is something that the OR Center is contemplating developing. Um, ten years ago at Columbia in IOR, uh, we had about um, 80 master students when I came in, mostly in financial engineering. And even at that point, our financial engineering program, which actually considered as just application of OR to, mar to market finance, that's how we view financial engineering at Columbia, um, the course offering was not, was not very large. Uh, this coming fall, this past fall, so in September, we welcomed 310 incoming master's students uh, in, in four master's programs. Operations research, about 140 incoming master's students. Uh, industrial engineering, very small, 20 students. Uh, and um, financial engineering, 70 students. And then a new master's program we started with the business school, and that's why Garrett can actually comment, management science and engineering. Uh, about 60 students. And 
I would say the following. Um, we were not able to, by the way, these are very selective programs, 10, 12% selectivity, very similar to, I would say, uh, comparable PhD programs. So to Mitch's point, I think when you build those programs with the kind of course offering that enables you to have both depth uh, in terms of the methodology mm -hmm. and breadth in terms of the course <coughs> offering, actually it's not difficult to market those programs both domestically and internationally. We started a program that was approved maybe in February. Mm -hmm. um, we started advertising it in January. We had, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, uh, Garrett, we had, what, uh, 400 applications? Mm -hmm. um, in no time. Yeah. Uh, with ve <laughs> and, and are we actually... No advertising. <laughs> no advertising. And so, um, and, and some of that offering clearly has to do with the methodology. We have now an ecosystem of 300 students. We can offer a lot more courses in financial engineering. We can offer a lot of courses in applications of OR to energy, applications of OR to healthcare, application to public policy. Um, we are offering courses, soft skills. We have three entrepreneurship courses. We have four corporate finance courses. Um, and so uh, having an ecosystem and a large scale enables actually several programs to coexist together where students are taking electives, sharing electives, and you have the economies of scale of actually having broad offering of courses, and for students to segment in terms of where they want to go, but also be able to actually get a fairly big breadth of experience in terms of the course offering. And certainly the new program we have at the business school, we actually expanded further uh, our mm -hmm. courses with project-oriented courses, case study-oriented courses, yeah. and also some MBA offerings, negotiations. So I, I think uh, the culture here at MIT is not one, has not been one of professional master's programs, but there are obviously other places uh, M Columbia being one, but Cornell, Stanford, where clearly those professional master's programs yeah. that are not two-year programs, that are actually one-year program or three-semester programs, uh, are very, very successful. And I, I think we're actually able to uh, get a large intake, have actually pretty good experience for the students. We are able to place them in very good jobs, not necessarily OR, but you know, finance, mm -hmm. consulting, marketing, I'm sorry for talking too much, but uh, basically I, just, I would just say that we are, now, we are now thinking about system engineering as another in new master's program in the next couple of years. And we're considering other things on the business analytics side, and, 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 and there is a market for that. There is a huge untapped market. Uh, maybe it's more difficult to market to industry. It is not that difficult to market to, to seniors and juniors and and, and, work, and young working professionals yeah. around the world to get them to be interested in, in what I call the field of OR. We consider our program OR to be the center. Industrial engineering is just the application of OR to manufacturing. Management, science, and engineering, which is a program with the business school, is just application of OR to uh, technology and management. Financial engineering is application of OR to, to, to market finance. System engineering is basically what will help us connect with other engineering departments as well as the School of Public Health, for example, at Columbia. So uh, there are actually a lot, lots of, of opportunities there, and there are universities actually that are actually tapping on it. Okay, so Gareth, do you want to come? Yeah, uh, well, i just just say one thing. I mean, just the concreteness of it. So we took that that pro program, and I, I'm remiss for having mentioned not mentioning it, but it was, it was, it was the traditional two-semester um, OR program that was originally... Um, and we basically tacked on an extra semester, so it's a full calendar year, an extra semester of classwork at the business school, which, as Suleiman mentioned, generates is, is all sorts of things, you know, project-based classes. They take um, some finance classes, negotiations, um, different sort of case study-oriented application areas. And so I, I think that's like a good concrete example of sort of, you know, taking the technical uh, side of the field and then augmenting it with some of these more you know, organizational business, you know, um, sort of skills that, that actually re required to, like, do that kind of, to make those, those analytical skills effective in practice. So you know, there's, an, there's an interesting issue here of branding, because as I heard you talk about your programs, 
I mean, it, for those that are familiar with MIT, we have the Leaders for Manufacturing Program, <coughs> the System uh -huh. Design Management Program, the Logistics Program. These are all programs that have OR content, right? They teach, I mean, Steve yeah. Graves yeah. teaches and some others yeah. teach in these courses, right? So they have OR content, and uh, a lot of people <coughs> do in financial engineering, but they don't brand it as OR, they brand it as financial engineering, right. mm -hmm. and they have OR content. That's a different model than, and, and if you did something that was analytics, you wouldn't call it OR, you'd call it analytics, right? Uh, so there's ways of infusing OR in these professional programs with other things. Right, and right. That's what happens in many of these. Right. Well, that, that's certainly one, one model is to kind of, yeah, it just have the OR component but have it a, as sort of a domain-specific degree. Yeah. But maybe this is like the essence of my complaint earlier is that you know, my, my, my sense would be like, but to the extent that we have general sort of OR degrees, I, I would position it as like, to Mitch's point about like, don't go into OR because it's a great profession. <laughs> go into it because it's like a great education. You know, it's like that, right, right, that to right. me, that's a different positioning of it. Because it's like the profession you end up in may not be classified as OR. Right. It, right. And, and that's, you know, I think that's a good point. Jonathan? Well, yeah, actually, it's kind of relevant. Vivek, whoever, whoever was there first. <laughs> yeah. So I'm Jonathan Eckstein. I got my PhD here in 89. I'm, a, I'm at Rutgers. So I have a question about this analytics word, okay? Because I've, what I've seen is there's this buzz phrase that's fairly you know, recent but seems to have a lot of traction of business analytics. And I think it presents an opportunity because management science, OR, you know, someone, it's, it's almost impossible for, for an ordinary person to guess what they mean. Whereas business analytics, you can kind of guess what it means. And so, but I think there seems to be a danger that business analytics is going to be defined as only descriptive analytics, only sort of pumped up statistics. And I, don't un I can't really think of why OR isn't business analytics. I mean, it's, it seems like the same thing to me. So, so this I have given some thought. Yeah. Uh, so I actually, if, I, you know, if it was up to me, I would bet the future of OR in, in this area. Uh, in the same way that uh, IBM does does it. Why? Uh, and I, when I mean analytics, I mean all parts, all of the breadth of OR, from data to modeling to optimization to stochastic modeling to name it. Uh, it's a brand new name. The world is focusing on this area. Huge amount of resources are entering. I mean, I, I mean from all the opportunities I see in front of us uh, as a field, I would, I would put my bets on that. And others are doing it as well. I mean, it's not that uh, we are unique in that respect. So in the same way that uh, I think uh, we at MIT are also thinking at also placing a serious bet on this, we're having doubling the size of the program. So I think it's a good bet. I definitely believe that. What is the difference between business analytics and OR? What is important is that this, ex I mean, I, you know, I don't mind and I don't think that's a, right. there might be none. But what I think is, but there's a, a big importance in outcomes. There's a lot of buzz about analytics. There's a lot of resources. Companies are, you know, I mean, to give you a, sm a small example, I, I taught in a, an executive MBA program in the last spring, about 60, 60 65 people uh, that are CEOs of companies, uh, yeah, fairly higher people. So uh, I taught the data models and decisions class, and then after the class, uh, you know, almost the entirety of the Sloan School uh, proposed uh, different electives. Uh, there were about 15, 20 proposals. They selected two. One analytics course, um, we proposed an analytics course, and a strategy course. So that's an interesting, this was, this was not obligatory, this was a choice. And uh, this suggests to me that uh, that's an early indication of, uh, of something is happening in that and we can make a change. In. Yeah, I, so I, I, I would draw one distinction, then maybe add. Uh, you know, we, we have the privilege of uh, residing between, I would say, engineering and business as a profession. And uh, so we're not a business analytics in the sense of that. And you know, there's a number of programs developing in engineering systems, right, which, again, you could say, well, that's OR, right? And so we're a bit of both. And the question is, do we put all of our eggs into the business basket or the engineering basket or both? How do we think about that? So that's the, I mean, that's the problem with business analytics is it's not all business. That's something that all is It's not all business, it's not all OR, not all right? OR because OR does other things, right? Right, right. Ed? But, well, so 
Um, so, yeah, you, you, you essentially said much of what I was going to say, but of course I have to say something. Uh, <laughs> you of know, course you have to, one yes. Of, one of, one of, in the last couple of years, uh, something interesting has happened in the economics field with this whole Freakonomics thing. And, and the thing about Freakonomics, which is interesting, is that uh, it's kind of convincing people that, you know, you can use economic reasoning for just about anything. That's really what they've done. And people get into arguments about whether or not they push it too far. But basically, in terms of as both an educational device and a marketing device and a way of motivating people who actually are in economics programs, it's, it's, it's been, I think, a great success. That's the sort of thing I'd like to see in OR. And, uh, you know, t to me, uh, I, I, don't, I don't have a buzzword, but the idea would be operations anything. And what do I mean by that? It's the ability to see operations in just about anything. That, that I mean, you know, what, what is it that makes operations research different at all from just, you know, applied math or, or, or just engineering systems or what have you? Well, at least historically, we know what the difference is. It was, it was this whole focus on operations. The scientific part came from the fact that, you know, there's certain things which are just done over and over and over again. So you have the ability to collect data. You have the ability to study them scientifically. You have the ability to improve them, whether it comes from the military or whether it's an industry or, or what have you. But when I think about some of the more interesting stuff, it, at least to me, that's been done in the last several years and people around the field are working on now, be it in, in some of the humanitarian logistics stuff or disaster relief, certainly all kinds of things in health, social networks, uh, you name it, a lot of it has to do with sort of seeing operations in places where people don't see operations. And then once they can be characterized that way, all of a sudden our tool set becomes pretty valuable. So I like this idea of operations anything. I'm not sure how you, you know, it needs a better name than that. Uh, but but, but that, that's sort of the spirit I think would be good. And, and that's something which wouldn't, you know, that's not a whole new program. But, but that might be a class. That might be a class you could have, operations anything. And the whole idea is go out, find problems where no one's ever done any OR before, and turn that stuff into uh, OR problems. I think that could be pretty yeah, exciting. Pretty interesting, yep. Uh, hi, my name is Vivek Perais. Uh, so, uh, actually, as I was standing here, I realized my question is actually more about the, the present of OR and perhaps a little bit about its past, but there's no panel by that name, so I figured I'd ask the question here. Uh, so, I guess, uh, you know, the quote unquote internet economy of the last uh, 15 years has uh, yielded sort of a gold rush of, uh, of problems uh, of uh, scientific and business nature. Uh, a lot of these problems, I think, are very, at least in retrospect, uh, very aligned with uh, sort of the uh, liberal science uh, training that uh, uh, operations researchers have. Uh, but at the same time, I, I wonder, uh, you know, whether OR has left really any mark on any of these problems as they're solved or understood uh, today. Uh, maybe I'm wrong, but that's, that's my contention. Uh, so I guess my question is, how could that happen? How did that happen? Uh, right. So, so I, I, you know, of course, there's a lot of people now that have sort of jumped out of the bandwagon, but I suspect it's a bit too late. Uh, so, you know, what, how 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 could something like this have have transpired over over the last uh, ten or fifteen years? Right. So, first of all, would the panel agree? And secondly, uh, if so, how did it happen? Okay. So I would say, I mean, I don't, know, I don't know enough about that area to really, whether we agree or not. But I mean, let, let's take this, that as being um, true. But I, I think it kind of gets to this area that the domain experts are kind of the ones that hit this stuff first. I mean, it's like, how is an OR person going to stumble on, you know, this, the inner guts of some, you know, internet commerce problem or something like that, unless they're kind of deeply embedded in looking at internet commerce stuff. So I think it's sort of the na natural that, you know, the computer science community and the people who are actually engineering and developing those systems are the first ones that bump into it. And so they're the first ones that kind of come up with their own flaky auction designs <laughs> and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, and it's like, you know, it's, you know, because they're, you know, that's their job. They have to, they, they have to do it. And it's only later, kind of, when the OR people say, "Oh, you know, I kind of, I saw that," and it starts to become popular, and they kind of, it, a wider group of people become aware of the practice or whatever that, that I think OR people jump in. So, um, yeah. So the, I mean, 
My guess is if you looked at a lot of OR problems, like were, the, were OR the first people that like worried about inventory problems? I prob probably not. Um, it was probably manufacturing people that worried about inventory problems, and then not until it became more established did, o did OR people kind of go into it. And and that's that's a very young field, so I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't despair too much that we haven't yet had an impact on it because I could I could certainly see that happening, and it'd probably take people like you and others to devote themselves to that application area and stick with it long enough that you start to have an impact and you know, that would be my guess on it. So, so I actually do think that this has happened. I mean, uh, I do believe You're not that as pessimistic. But I, I think, for instance, uh, if you look at, uh, you know, Google, let's say, the, 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 one of the major developments was really, in essence, a mark of chain uh, thing, something about teaching the first, first, first courses, right? first probably the course that we teach. Yet, the people who developed it did not connect it like, like that. It became uh, an independent. So this has happened. Now, why it happened, um, um, I think it's, uh, it's the, right, the, the right people, I mean, Larry Page and Sergey, we're in the right time, and <laughs> so the, I think it's a matter of luck. I, I would, I would say, or perhaps uh, maybe not luck. But, uh, but I think what we can do after the fact is, in a sense, uh, t try to position it that this is indeed uh, a problem of the type that we are, we are uh, covering. The, uh, ads, advertising, uh, name it. I mean, uh, they are all problems of the classical variety with a twist and so forth. So, uh, I mean, in many ways, it's. It, I mean, one can say why it happened. I mean, I. I'm not 100 percent of that, but uh, but uh, I definitely believe we can do something moving forward, namely uh, m making it more p prevalent in our courses uh, in, and so forth. So when when I teach, for example, I have this class that I call I, I call it the analytic edge, the operation everything. Uh, so uh, the first lecture is on, on on Google. I mean, the first lecture is on, is, is on that. So in, in a sense, we can I mean uh, we, we can say well. Consistent with what the analytics business. All right, let the, I think we've got maybe quickly one more, two more questions. Yes. Zhe <laughs> Hongqi with their China Limited. Um, I think we. When we talk about the relevancy of, of OR, we probably need, need to think about ac academia and the industry in the real world. I think in academia, we're probably pretty well organized, but uh, we're well recognized. But in, in industry, we're hopelessly, I mean, in the real world, we're probably hopelessly under-recognized. I mean, I don't, I don't know how many times I've been asked, oh, you've got a PhD in what field, operations research, what is it? So I have to explain it, and I have to break it down. I said, always oh, a combination of math, Applied math, computer science, management science, oh, that makes sense. Now, what do you do? Then I, then I have to tell them, oh, we need to figure out a way to, to get things done in an optimal way. Now, what do you mean by optimal way? So, so you know, I, I don't think we can, we can win that battle. I mean, seriously, I, I think it's, it's, uh, it's probably hopeless. But I think we do need to, need to become more relevant. And I think by, to become more relevant, uh, I really think we need to build a connection between a very, in my opinion, a very elegant OR theory and OR uh, principles and the, the, uh, the real world. And, and, and when I was at Northwest, I mean, my, my boss would come to me and say, oh, you've got a PhD, I got this problem for you to solve. And how are, you, how are you going to do it? I said, oh, I'm going to employ some simulation techniques. What the heck is that? I mean, I don't care. Now, just get it done and tell me when, when you can get it done, how much improvement you can, uh, you know, you can deliver. So that's the sort of thing, sort of the challenge we, we face in the real world. So if we can teach our students to be very real-world real oriented and solution oriented and, and, and think, you know, position a problem and, and try, to, try to deliver a, a solution that actually makes a difference and makes an impact, I think that's, that's probably a very important thing for us to, to, to think about. And second of all, you know, uh, it, it's great that Dimitri spoke to the media for the first time. I think, you know, we need to latch on to those important problems. For example, you mentioned irregular operations in the airline, in the airline business. I mean, that's a huge deal. Congress wants to enact laws. DOT wants to make rules. The, pub, the general public are very angry with the, uh, with the airline industry. So if we can come out and say, hey, we got... Uh, 
you know, we, we get together with DOT, we get together with whoever and say, hey, we can, we can make a difference. We can make, uh, uh, propose some, uh, some solutions to, to make this, to alleviate this problem. I think we're going to make a, a great name for ourselves. Comments, reactions? My, my only comment is that uh, I do believe that OR has a public image problem. That, that's true. But, but uh, and I also feel that, uh, you know, in a way, marketing the field better by talking to the media or, let's say, movies like Moneyball, um, you know, would help in, the, in that way. That is, I, I actually believe that, I mean, in fact, many people that know nothing about my, you know, my people, my neighbors, uh, understand far more based on the movie than, than whatever I can tell them. Right. So I, I do feel that um, the field could benefit from, from, uh, from, yeah. a, from a, in a way, public relation campaign that uh, would yeah. help it. Actually, yeah, I, I've just given up on trying to explain it. Like, oh, <laughs> really? I, I really have. It's like somebody asked me what I do. I just say, well, you know, I, I do work on pricing and right. problems, and it's an intersection of economics and applied math, and that works much better. I mean, <laughs> trying to unless I, unless I kind of get a little glimmer that that person knows what OR is, and I said, oh yeah, I've got a PhD in OR. And like, oh, okay, yeah, yeah. But I mean, if they otherwise, I, like, what's the point? I mean, it's like, it, it's you know. I, I just don't. That's what I mean. That's how I think. That's that's where I think we have this. That's where I think we have a problem. I don't think we need to have mm -hmm. that our profession commonly known. I just don't think we need that. Um, as, I mean, as frustrating as it is at parties, and I mean, they still walk away after <laughs> ten minutes. Then, yeah. okay, yeah, like but, but don't boring. forget IBM and analytics. This might be a, in the well. That, that, that's a good description. If you if that's what you do, if you do that kind of stuff, that's a good description. Okay. But not all of us do that kind of stuff. So, all right, a great responsibility. The last question. This is actually going to be a comment, and it's a dissenting view. My name is Deborah Stabile, and I graduated class of '81. Can everyone hear me? Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, I I've been sitting in the back listening, and and it it feels fairly depressing, I think, to be hearing what I'm hearing. And I want to tell you, I want to offer you hope and confidence because I think the OR um, degree and why, what I think we all share in common is a, is a passion and a love for problem solving. And that's what we do. And, and that is needed everywhere. And my career personally has gone in a very, di very different directions. I started out working in a consulting firm. Um, I then worked for the city of New York, where they embraced early on um, applying analytics. You heard about the New York City Police Department. I actually worked with the fire department, sanitation department. And then I went into the financial services industry, where it is a powerhouse of embracing and leveraging. Maybe they went too far in some areas, but, but embraced it and loved it. So it's not about what you're called. It arose by any other name, right? It's about what you do with it mm -hmm. and how you um, apply that energy and that passion. What you have is a set of skills that in this ever-changing world, and my God, you saw the data that Dimitri presented, you need to be armed to be able to adapt and, and allow your skills to take you where the industries are going, as well as help define the industries. And you can and you will because you have those skill sets. What I would offer for education and better prepping the students of today and as we go forward is that because of the passion for the problem solving itself, you sometimes lose sight of what you're trying to, what the end product is. And so when you're at in, in a business environment, most of your colleagues will want to get to the punchline first. And so it's not about the journey, which we all enjoy, of how we got to the solution. It's about tell me the answer and then tell me quickly how what it means. I would say the other thing we get sometimes lost in is our hypothesis going in, and we don't see what others would see. And so for training, I would also offer that at the end, what do I, what, what do I see, and what, what would others see as we look at the same problem? And how do I anticipate and understand their problems and what they're trying to solve? And have I looked at the problem in multiple ways, not just through the, my eyes or my team's, team's eyes? You will start out as individuals, um, I'm saying this to the students of today, um, if you go into a business or health field um, as what we call individual contributor likely. You're not going to be given a team, but you'll grow and grow and you'll take on teams. And those soft skills are critical. 
you will learn by observing, but getting some good grounding and some understanding of the, the puts and takes of what makes a, a good leader. I, leaders, I think, are born, but I think you can become a better leader. You'll have great bosses, you'll have lousy bosses, but you'll, you'll learn from both because they both bring something. But, but it's a great field you're in. It's a great field that builds and allows you to grow into, the, into this world. So I, I just felt compelled I had to say that. No, Ashley, thank you very much for that. I'm not going to ask the panelists to respond to that. So, um, I actually, uh, I, I was sort of viewing our conversation a bit differently uh, as schizophrenic uh, in the sense that uh, there was sort of a bit of moaning about, you know, no one knows about us and we've got to use other names and the like. But I also uh, sort of felt that the panel was very buoyant about OR. And, and boy, boy, really buoyant about uh, about the methodology base and the power of it. It's a buy. Right, it's a buy. <laughs> Uh, Strong quite, quite buoyant, and I was, and I, you know, every every time Garrett got up and said, you know, I don't care what they call me, I just want to do great stuff. I said, boy, rah rah, right? It's, yeah. uh, uh, you know, I think uh, we've we do provide, I think, an exceptional base for people to go out and do interesting things for the world. Uh, we, uh, I think, have a profession that has deep intellectual content that is uh, useful for the world, and we have, I think, represented in this room a number of icons of people that have gone out and made enormous contributions to national security, to health care, to, to uh, the financial industry, to marketing, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I think we should feel very proud about that in terms of that. Uh, but there is this sort of sense of what is OR and all that kind of thing, right? And so that's, I think that's a bit of the schizophrenic. So I want to thank the panelists and also thank the audience. Uh, I think that uh, this has been a very rich conversation. Um, I'll just close on one thing. Uh, Right after uh, the Red Sox lost uh, this, uh, Ed sent around a little diagram. A little, he said it was the most depressing plot he'd ever seen in his life. And it plotted the following. The probability the Red Sox will make the uh, playoffs. And it started at maybe some 70% or something like this, grew up to about 99.9% .9 or something like this, and then through September did this. And then dropped, of course, to zero. Except, as Larry points out, in the middle of the final games, it should have had a little blip up and back, up and back down. <laughs> and so, I think uh, I think one of the morals of all this is we should listen to Dimitri about almost everything, except baseball. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much. <laughs>. Yeah, to, uh, in, to regarding organization, I mean, we have the That's poster great. session uh, until 12, and then uh, on, and then lunch at the faculty club. And, and the faculty club is, uh, uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, in uh, building E53, sixth floor. This is the on that way, the sixth floor of that building. 12 o'clock is the E53, sixth floor, is the lunch. 52, 52. E52, I'm sorry. Yeah. So, so if I just may say, wait, 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 wait before we break, before we break, uh, the, the students have devoted lots of time to creating these posters. So those of you alumni, please go visit the posters, talk to the students. They'd love to, love to have a chat with you.